and I were talking a few weeks back, and we were talking about truly the importance about meditation upon our worship and how if we're not careful, the things that we do can become routine and they be- can become mundane or can become uh, a bit of putting us in a rut to where we truly don't focus on why it is that we're here on Sunday mornings. This day is a day of dedication to the Lord, a day in which we are to focus upon Him, to exalt His name and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, And before each of the acts that we have uh, in worship, we're going to have a specific devotional for that. So in place of me preaching for only 12 minutes or something like that, which I normally do, right? Yeah, a little bit of giggles there. 49 last Sunday night. Sorry about that one. Didn't realize it went that long. Uh, In place of me preaching one long sermon, what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of shorter devotionals to help to prepare our minds and to put our minds within the right place before each of our acts of worship. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a devotional, and then we will uh, at least uh, have a song between these acts, or a song and then a devotional between these acts, as a way of focusing our hearts and our minds on what we're doing. And this day is meant to be a dedication uh, unto the Lord, as is every Sunday, but we're wanting to make sure that we're really dedicating our hearts and our minds and meditating upon what God would have for us to do. Oftentimes when you look to the Old Testament and you look to the Old Law, you'll see as, as they would look to the, to the law, they would read from the Word of God and, and see what it is that they're supposed to be doing and then they would practice it. So that's the same kind of thing that we're going to do this morning. Our devotionals are going to be scripture filled. We're going to look to His will for man, look to His will for us, and then we're going to do those things as we enter into this worship. So to help prepare our minds this morning, let's look at a couple of passages beginning with Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. And we're going to look at quite a few, and I'd encourage you, if you take notes, I'd encourage you to to jot them down. If you flip in your Bibles, you can do that too. But each of the verses will also uh, be uh, copied and pasted upon the the screen behind us in the New King James Version for for you to read along with. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Wonderful set of context there for Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is is delivering a wonderful and powerful message. And he says in verse 21, this is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says in verse 21, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He would later deliver a message to the woman of Samaria at the well in John chapter 4 and verse 24, as she is seeking to find the place in which man should go to worship. And he responds with not on a mountain or not in some uh, specific location. He says in verse 24, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what we can see from John 7 and verse 21 is that we're to do the will of the Father who is in heaven. That's our goal. That's what we strive for. Not just to be a proclaimer of his name, not just to say that I am a Christian, but a doer of his will. And in doing so that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. He says in John chapter 6 and verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus himself followed after the will that he was sent to do from the Father. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, you'll notice this. On the first day of the week, those who were followers of Jesus, those who had been added to the Lord's church, those who were seeking to do his will, they gathered upon the first day of the week. And when the disciples came together, they broke bread. And Paul, ready to depart the next day, he speaks to them and he continues his message until midnight. We could, of course, also look at Acts chapter 2 and the continuation of their journey together as they exit uh, through that day of Pentecost into a day of growth, a day of focusing upon what is next for them. And so they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and their teaching and the breaking of bread and the sharing of the things that they have. Each of these things was done in accordance to his will for the specific purpose of meditation upon his will and continuing it in his will. So as we begin this morning, we're about to go into our period where we're going to sing. And to prepare our hearts to sing, we're going to read a couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 5, a very wonderful, wonderful set of scripture. Uh, Verse 19 gives a specific encouragement here. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. As well as Jesus himself as he uh, was preparing to depart from his disciples in Matthew 26 and verse 30. When they sung a hymn, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. 
there they went and to pray. You'll notice uh, that Jesus himself partook in this, this hymn singing, this singing and making melody in the heart. And these specific instructions given to us in Ephesians chapter 5 and in Colossians chapter 3 is for the specific purpose of not just exalting the name of God, but also to encourage one another and to educate one another. So as we enter into this period of our worship and as we begin to sing our songs, let us have our hearts and minds focused on what the true intention of singing is, which is to exalt the name of God and to exalt one another to help us to be lifted up and to help to prepare our minds to glorify him in all that we do. To get the full meaning of our songs this morning, we'll sing all, all verses. 780 is our first song. If it's convenient, would you please stand for this song? <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Five hundred ninety, five hundred ninety. Before we have our devotional for the prayer, let's sing all three verses of number 98, 98. 
sweet hour of prayer. <clears throat> from what he was doing, whether it was entering into a city or uh, going to uh, help someone who is in need, he would oftentimes take a moment to find a place of seclusion, to find a place, uh, in fact, the word that is often used, a deserted place, a place where no one was to be around. And oftentimes he would not go there alone, he would take others with him, take maybe his disciples or his apostles or those who were following after him with him, and he would find these places so that he could separate himself for moments of prayer. In fact, if you were to look at Matthew chapter 4, before he enters into that, that temptation that he would face in the wilderness, he spends 40 days in fasting and in prayer. Oftentimes after his miracles or after many wonderful things were done in the presence of many others, he would leave a large group of people and would go off by himself and he would pray. And he would use that opportunity to speak with the Father to gain strength and encouragement. And if it's the case that our Savior, the one who lived a perfect life, found it fitting and, and found it to be fitting to often separate himself from the world and separate himself from the distractions of this world, to spend time in communication with the Father, it is, it is almost necessary, or if not, it is inferred to be necessary within our own lives as well. The perfect sinless sacrifice, who is Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, needed to separate himself from the world so that he could communicate with the Father. 
and we do too. So as we enter into this next period, as we go before our Father in prayer, a couple passages I would like for us to keep in mind, not just Acts chapter 2, verse 42, which we mentioned previously, of this continuing in this prayer. They encourage one another, they strengthen one another, and they were fervent within their prayers. I would also like us to, to think of the words found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says simply, to pray without ceasing, to continue always in prayer. He says, in everything, in verse 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Think you, you don't have anything to pray for? Well, simply count the blessings that God has given you and pray for those things and you'll have a, a moment always that you could go to the Lord in prayer. And what we're going to do in this next period is we're going to have uh, two different prayers. One that is going to be offered up specifically for our worship this morning and one that is going to be offered up for our congregation itself. So let's enter into this period of prayer together. Our gracious Father in heaven, we're thankful for your goodness, for the privilege of assembling at this place for the purpose of worship to thee. Father, we ask that you would be with us in our efforts of offering up worship to thee that the things that we do would be done in spirit and in truth, that we would dismiss from our minds things of a worldly nature that would hinder our worship, that we might be pleasing in your sight. We're thankful for your son and our savior that gave his life that we can have this privilege of worship to thee and know that our sins can be forgiven through that blood. Help us, Father, to never neglect our privilege of prayer to thee. We pray that our prayers would come before thee always in humility, knowing that thou art God, and that you know the thoughts and intents of our heart even before we ask. We ask that you would help us to grow in faith, in knowledge of your word as we, from time to time, come together in worship to thee. Strengthen our faith. Help us to be the proper example before others. To be an encouragement to one another to love and good works. We recognize, Father, that we sin. And we pray that thou would Forgive us of our shortcomings. Help us to recognize our faults and to turn from them. And we pray, Father, that as we go through the different acts of worship to thee, that we would not be distracted, but that you would be the focus of all that we do in our worship to thee, that we might bring glory and honor to your name. We ask in Christ's name.
Helene. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we realize that there are three institutions that have been ordained by thee in thy word. The home, the church, and civil government. We come to you at this time in prayer, praying for the church. The church universal, and especially at this time for the church that meets here at East Hill. We pray this morning that you would bless us as a church as we are engaged in this period of worship before thee, we pray that the thoughts and the intents of our hearts are pure, that we as a church, both individually and collectively, will worship in the way that you would have us to worship. We are thankful for the sacrifice, the great sacrifice made on our behalf that made the church possible. We're thankful for your foresight and for your love in establishing that institution. We pray that each one of us will recognize that it is us as individual members who comprise this body. We pray that you will help us to edify and to love one another to be long-suffering to each other, to be kind one to another. We pray that we as a church will dwell together in unity, that there will be no schism within the body here, that we will all live our lives in such a way that we can make it easy for Christ to present that body to God as a glorious body one day. We pray that you will continue to be with us as we worship thee this morning, that every act that we engage in as thy church will be uplifting, that it will edify thy name, that it will bring glory and honor to thee. We thank you again for that great sacrifice. We pray that you will help us to live in such a way that we always bring glory and honor to thee, not only as individuals, but as the church. We pray again that you would bless the congregation here at East Hill this morning and bless us as we worship. In Christ's name, amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's Sing all three verses of 341, 341.
While Jesus was on this earth, he was concerned with many a thing, and he addressed a lot of those moments in teachable moments where he gathered his disciples together and used some sort of analogy or used some sort of object as a way of, of showing them the importance of his teachings or showing them how they can carry out his will. And even before Jesus came to the earth, there was instituted several feasts that the Israelites were to take place and, and take part in as a way of remembering certain promises that God had made to them and, and most had been fulfilled at the time. And so as Jesus is about to leave this earth, as he is about to depart and be with us no longer, he sat down with his disciples and he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper, a memorial feast that is to be taken upon the first day of the week as a way of remembrance of the great sacrifice that he gave. Something that was carried on, uh, as we mentioned in Acts 20 and verse 7, by the first century church. Something that was instituted and reminded of by the teachings of Paul to the church at Corinth. He says in verse 23 of, of 1 Corinthians 11, For I have received from the Lord that which I also have delivered unto you, that this Jesus, on the same, day, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He would also say in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, The cup of blessing which we bless is not in the communion of the blood of is it not in the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is, is not in the communion of the body of Christ. As we gather before this feast, it might not be a, a big table, it might not be a plate full of food, but it's a feast nonetheless, a feast of remembrance a way of partaking of emblems which reminds us of the great sacrifice that Jesus made upon that cross. The great sacrifice which allows for us to be cleansed from our sins, for us to have confidence and hope in knowing that we have been cleansed and set free. And this is a way to remember that body that he offered upon the cross and the blood that was shed upon that cross. At this time, we're going to be served the Lord's Supper. Our Father in heaven, as we enter into another act of worship this morning, as we gather around your table to partake at this time the bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray that you will help us put away the things of the world and focus on this and the death upon the cross. As we partake of this bread, we, we pray that we will do so in an acceptable manner. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
In like manner, Heavenly Father, we come to you before to give thanks for this cup. Father, we're thankful for the meaning of this cup, the remission of our sins that it brings as we take of this cup. We pray that we, as we take this cup, we do so in a well-pleasing manner and in a good sight in your eyes and according to your will. Father, we, all these things that we've been given today, all the things that we get to enjoy, our Christianity, our faith, and the promise of heaven is through this cup, and we're thankful for that. And it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Three hundred sixty. <clears throat> oh, why do the As we prepare to partake of the collection, there's a few important things that we can note in Scripture. 
Of course, we could always look to the wonderful passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's writing about the work of the church. He's making mention of his desire to be with the church, and he says there's a few things that need to take place while I'm not there, and giving is one of those, because he says, as it pertains to the co collection, uh, as I have given unto the orders, or as I have given orders also unto the churches of Galatia, so also you must do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as, I have, as he may prosper, so that there be no collection when I come. When, Peter, or when Paul joins the church there at Corinth, he doesn't need to be worried about things like the collection of the saints. And so he says, as you gather upon the first day of the week, as you as Christians gather upon the first day of the week, let each of one of you have laid aside something to give as an offering unto the Lord for the continuation of the work of the church. We can also see in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, But this I say, that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. So let each one give as he has prospered in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. But, uh, and, and God is able to make all grace uh, abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. We could also look to passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 5. Moreover, brethren, I make, I make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial and of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of of their liberality and their liberalist, their liberality and their giving, for I bear witness that according to their abilities, yes, and above, and above or beyond their abilities, they were freely giving, imploring with us with with much money, with a, excuse me, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering unto the saints, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave of themselves to the Lord. And then us, by the will of God, as we prepare to give, as we prepare to offer sacrifice like many have done before us, like we have done before, even before, help us to prepare our, march, our hearts and our minds to do so in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Not, not scared or, or, or spiteful in our giving, but doing so with a cheerful heart, ready to reap what has been sowed, ready to give back as we have prospered. Truly, every gift that we have is a gift from above. Truly, every blessing that we receive, even those that we mention in prayers and those that we forget to mention in our prayers, have been given first to us by the Lord. It's only fit that as we have opportunity upon the first day of the week to give back, that we do so with a cheerful heart, thanking God and returning the favor that has first been given unto us. We'll now enter that, enter that period of giving. most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for once again giving us this day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to approach you in prayer. Thank you for everything that you allow us to enjoy through our lives each and every day. Thank you for the way we make our, our way in our life, our means. We're thankful for the, the ability to provide for our families, provide for our congregation and our communities by giving back according to your word. Father, as we give today and as we go through our day, we ask that you be with us, continue to allow us to give with cheer and joy in our hearts, and just be with us every day, Father, and keep blessing us as, as, we, as we have been blessed, and we're so thankful for that, and it's in your son's holy name that we pray, amen.
Before we have our next devotional, if it's convenient, would you please stand? We'll sing all three verses of 495. Yay! We read. Jesus, while on this earth, often uh, would begin his teachings with a teaching that those who were present were familiar with. He would begin by reading from some Old Testament prophet or from some section of the Torah, of the law. And he would do so as a way of bringing to remembrance the laws in which they were to follow. And he would use these as guides or use these as moments to teach. And oftentimes, like we spoke about in class this morning, when the disciples went out and to minister to those and to deliver the message of Jesus to the world, they would often find those who were confused or who were reading in a section of Scripture and were seeking after an understanding, they would often find, find them and, and meet them where they were at, read together, and instruct them and show them the way of Jesus, show them the way of the Messiah. So it's very important not only that we use this as an act of our worship, but our Scripture reading is, is also a way that we can build up our personal relationships with God because we have a better understanding of our word, uh, of his word, while also preparing us to go and share his word with others. When you look at passages like Acts chapter 2, and I referenced verse 42 quite a few times this morning for the specific purpose of this is immediately after the, fall, the beginning of the church, the founding of the church upon the day of Pentecost, immediately after that, they continued in all of these things. They read from God's word. They, they uh, were blessed with great fellowship. They broke bread together and they prayed together, exalting the name of God as well as encouraging one another as they begin this new journey together. We could also look at charges like we're given to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, which states, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heat up for themselves teachers. And they will, will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside unto fables. We can also look at Matthew chapter 28. We also mentioned this a little bit in Bible class this morning. Verses 18 and 20, what is known as the Great Commission. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, 
make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice this, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Scripture reading was always an important part of the New Testament church's practices. It's an important part of our worship unto God ourselves. It was an important part of the old law. In fact, they showed such great desire to learn about the word. They showed such great uh, respect towards the word that when the word was read, they would all stand. And so as we enter into this period of reading, we're going to read from Psalm 95, verses 1 through 11. I would encourage each of us to please, if you would, stand while this scripture is read. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand, <coughs> in his hand are the deep places of the earth, the strength of the hills, is also is he is also the sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land oh come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our maker for he is our god and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today if you will hear his voice harden not your heart as in the prov provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And to whom I swear, in my, in my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. You may be seated. One of the most beautiful parts about the teachings of Jesus is the invitation to follow Jesus. The opportunity that each, of, each one of us is granted to become a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ the Messiah. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song and, and offer up an opportunity for those to respond to that very invitation that Jesus offered, the offer to become a follower of his will, to follow after the, the teachings that he delivered unto us, to help to provide for us a path to live our lives by so that we can be in heaven with him for eternity. Even David himself, as he is writing this psalm, you'll notice in Psalm 95, a few of the many wonderful things that he mentions is, it comes in verse 3. For the Lord is the great God and the great King who is above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it in his hands. They form the dry land. So what is our natural response to this? So come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Notice what he says about the hearing of the voice, the hearing of this offer, the hearing of this, these words which, which utter out and which invite others to obey his will. He says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers, they tested God, they tried God, and they saw his work. Forty years he was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts. They do not know my way, so I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. So the challenge to you today as we sing this song, as you have the Lord's invitation offered to you to become a follower of Jesus, to put him on in baptism, to kill that old man of sin, repent of those old ways, to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God based on that belief that you have of the study of his word, a changing of your heart, a changing of your mind, a giving of your life to Christ, putting that old man of sin to death to rise to walk in newness of life, through the cleansing waters of baptism, to live a life that is faithful and service unto him.
If you're hearing that call this morning to obey the gospel and you have not yet obeyed that gospel, you have not yet obeyed that teaching, you have allowed for your heart to become hardened and have ignored the words that the Lord has delivered, we'll simply repeat those words that we see there at the end of Psalm 95. The Lord will, will allow for you or will show you His wrath. Without being a follower of His word, without seeking to do what is right in His sight, you'll be found separated from Him. Or you can be one who follows after His will, who humbly submits unto it, and who gives your life in service unto the Lord. If it's the case this morning that you need to be baptized in the Lord's church for the remission of your sins, or that you need to repent of your sins and get right with God, change that way of life, and live a, a life that is filled with righteousness and is filled with, with following after His will, please do so as we stand and as we sing. Mm -hmm.